I am unashamed. What about you? Well, welcome back, Maddie. <laughs> I like that we got the, mal- the, the, the melody of Maddie is back. So uh, Maddie is our producer here, and she uh, had to get her wisdom teeth cut out, which I don't know how wise that is right before you're getting married, because you need all the wisdom that you can get. Does the wisdom go out with the teeth is my question. Why do they call them that? Well, they come with age. They come, come with age. Is that what it is? Yep, that's what I think. But then they cut them out. So, yep. what is it? I'm trying to figure out a metaphor for that, but I don't know. Well, I've, I've, never think, had, I've, I, I've got them, but, I, but I've never had them cut out. Well, I've got like two fangs. Like, mine never came all the way in, so there's like a couple of fangs up there. Somebody dubbed it wisdom, and you fell for it. That has I guess nothing so. to do with wisdom. <laughs> So I don't. Age should bring about the wisdom, but which is once again a marketing ploy. <laughs> oh boy, Someone, back on the marketing. Al, life—that's what life is. I mean, yesterday, I, I'm look at me. I'm not a marketing person. Actually, you but, con- you come up with some pretty good marketing ideas. I think you are a marketing person. You just well, you just don't realize it. It's because you just I see through the shallowness. Of today's marketing. I mean, yesterday, uh-huh. Zach and I got in. You would think he's the marketing guru. I brought up the idea of giving somebody a bumper sticker as a reward. He's like, <laughs> just, I mean, I think there's a little show called The Chosen. They give them bumper stickers. And guess what? I see them all over the place. The little gospel diagram with yep. the arrow coming down. Yep. What about the little fish yep. that people put on the back? Seeing the fish. I, well, why is that working? Because it this it works. People spend a lot of time in cars, so that led to me getting to make my wife's day today. Because she said, "Well, you never told me about the podcast yesterday." I said, "Oh, you you will love it. You need to listen to that episode." And she said, "Why?" I said, "Because I just destroyed Zach on a marketing <laughs> conversation. Doesn't happen very often." <laughs> She said, what happened? I said, you were involved. And she went, uh-oh. I said, no, it's good. I was like, I, I have the idea about a bumper sticker to all the, the fans of the blind. You could make, you know, I was blind, but now I see. Or, you know, so, something, can you see this, the blind? Or you, you could make a, you could make it fun. And so she, she was like, I think that's a good idea. I was like, well, thank you, babe. <laughs> I said, but where I went in, what what caused the disruption where we thought we were losing connection with Zach, which <laughs> let me translate that. <laughs> I said, when he said, what do you know about marketing? I said, have you seen my wife? <laughs> that ended that discussion. <laughs> How yeah, she did love that. How, she that did. was a win for you, man. You, but, but you kind of you've kind of changed the story a little bit. But that's okay. I, I didn't. <laughs> oh, you think? I, you think Jason well, would, would change things around a little historical and listen to the podcast? That was the cliff notes. I didn't. I don't get remember it. being negative against it. I uh, I like the idea. It was kind of funny because you've actually gotten better with your pitch now. Because before it was, I think your line was. I've seen the trailer, and that was the bumper sticker. And I just, I was thinking that we need a little bit more or something that helps with the branding of the blind. But see, now you've got the, I, you know, I see it, the blind. That's good. That's a, yep. yeah. You've, well, you've I mean, agreed. I wasn't going to lay out a four point plan to you. I just thought the concept <laughs> was so good that you'd say, oh, so great Jace, idea. you see yourself more as a, is a high view marketing person. You're not down in the weeds doing all the right and like, copy. Do you want me to go ahead and write it out and send it to all your employees? <laughs> Chase is an idea, man. Zach. It's a concept. Eric, I got that concept has never failed since the, the invention sticker. of the cars. People just, yeah. what do you, you know, I'm in traffic all the time. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it happened to Dad. That's true. It happened to Dad. I remember years ago when we were just doing videos and way before there was TV and all that. And the word was, Dad, that you had a – here's the way they put it because everybody gets things a little bit wrong. You had a Ph.D. in marketing from tech and that That's you funny. and your cleverness and marketing skills had come up with this whole – 
beard and camo and the, the whole duck, you know, persona. Mm -hmm. And it was all just a massive marketing ploy on your part because you were a marketing genius. So that, that was the word that was going around on you, uh, back, you know, 20 years, yeah. 20 plus years Which ago. Actually, he got this idea from where we're at. <laughs> You'll spend a couple. My, my, my uh, college education only brought me a meeting with the dean of men, <laughs> who said, "Clean all that crap out in front of your house, <laughs> because you you live on Scholar Drive, and you don't seem to be the most scholarly person we've educated out at Louisiana Tech here." <laughs> now, I think it's it's a winner over there because you said I made the plaque. You know, my, I ended you, up on the wall. You are on the Louisiana Tech Alumni Hall of Fame, or they call it the Wall of Fame. The Wall. So of they Fame. they got over the get all you you know you know straighten up you you live on Scholar Drive. You're a student at Louisiana Tech. You need to be the dean of men. Said I'm trying to come up with a word, Mr. Robertson. He said, I said not scholarly enough. <laughs> he said that's it. He said you need to. You need to show the people that you're, you're a scholarly individual. Yep. You're, you're, I said, you're man, that's all my Phil. equipment out there. I said, I got my decoys, you know, an old truck was sitting there, you know, mud mud truck, you know, four-wheel drive old truck there. Had nets in the yard, do a little net patch from time to time, fixing up decoys, painting them up a little bit. So they was all in my yard, and I thought I was looking at it at some good outdoor equipment. But they looked at it as not very scholarly. So when you remember things now, they say, "Okay, we 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 he took off. We we get it now." So I was up. I was four years old when we left there and moved to Junction City, which was when Jace was born. Right after that, and you know how when you're young, you just have flashes of memory, and it's usually something traumatic that sticks into your brain. But for me, I have flashes. I can still see a, a deer hanging, both inside and out. <laughs> so, if, if, it, if it wasn't deer season, it, it we would be clean hanging inside. up inside our little apartment there. There was a be there was a little there was a little cross beam in this little duplex we lived yep. in, and there was a rope on there, and there'd be an old deer hanging there. I don't know tub. I'd set that number tub three wash tub underneath. It. Drain the blood and the guts down in there. I you still know. remember that. Mm. Oh yeah, and that, does I, it just seem real scholarly? I'll, I'll admit, but <laughs> yep. yeah. it's smart if you're hungry and because uh, deer. I mean, how can you beat that? One of the memories I have, I don't think I've ever told this on the podcast, was uh, I was four, and Bradshaw was over at the house, and um, y'all were working on one of your trucks, trying to get it started or something. Y'all were under the hood. I remember this. And so we were right next to the road. You're so talking I, about the, the Terry Bradshaw and the- Terry Bradshaw. In the football world. Famous person, famous football player, and because uh, he and dad were teammates, and- um, and I guess friends. And so I was throwing rocks at cars and you gave me a warning. You told me to stop and I threw one more. And so then you, you gave me a good whipping right there in the front yard. And I, I can still remember the day. And what I remembered about it was that Bradshaw was laughing while you were giving me a whipping, which is to, to, I told Terry this when I first met him, I said, you know, I never liked you as a, I never liked you. I, I went with the cowboy. I went with Staubach and the Cowboys. <laughs> I said, the I reason, wonder how you became a cowboy. That fan. was it. It was really because was I remembered him laughing when I got my butt tore up and yeah. never got over it. And so when it came in the early 70s, when I became football aware, it was the Cowboys <laughs> or the Steelers. You'd think I would go with a guy I knew and you played football with. Nope. You know why that is? Laughed, at my, laughed at my calamity. But subconsciously, because when I think of Terry Bradshaw, I immediately hear him laugh on the set on a set somewhere. Because right. he laughs a lot. A lot. So mm -hmm. now if I had a, some kind of trauma... Just imagine Where you were getting your butt yeah. tore up and you hear that laugh. It triggers it. Every time <laughs> yeah. he's interviewed, he's going to laugh or, you know, he's on. So, yeah, I get it now. He's a good dude. And uh, as it turned great. out, uh, he pursued the football and came out very well. And and for all the ones that thought that somehow or another that the, the staying in the woods a lot was an act. Well, the truth's pretty well out there now. You know, it's, it was more than an act. Well, that's what I was going to yeah, say. I, I, just, I don't yeah. think you ever viewed it as a marketing ploy. Well, that's what no. I was going to say, though. Now, look, when we're in Luke 3. Uh, have we gotten to Luke 3 yet? Not quite, Jason. 
Well, we we're got, fixed to get. Still to got Luke another story three. in Luke two to get to. Okay, that's true. Jesus at the temple. Mm-hmm. But I just as a as a teaser, because our show never ends. That was a profound statement. We're always to be continued. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Oh, always. Yep. This is like almost a a spiritual soap opera. It is. Yep. It never ends. We had a That's name. what I don't like about Hollywood movies. That's why I was turned off. The first time I saw The End, I thought, yeah. what a bummer. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? That's why the shows you like, they come back for another shit. You know, you're like, oh, the journey will continue. And you're like, oh, when they put The End, I'm like, The End? <laughs> I don't want to think about The End. <laughs> so we're to be continued. But I wanted to say this. I think people who are reading the Bible from starting in the New Testament, they, when you get to John the Baptist, all of a sudden it's like a record scratch moment because you're like, this was, the, this was the marketing campaign? This was God's plan to have the guy who's in charge of market. What, what was John the Baptist's role? He'd to point people to Jesus. Prepare mm-hmm. the way. Yeah. Well, this this is like he he lived in the woods. So that's where I was going with this. Your marketing campaign really mirrored what happened here. John the Baptist was working on his character in the wilderness. Seriously. Yeah. And then when he got in public, he he didn't do anything in a in a public way that was called normal. And so when you look at our world today, it's the exact opposite. People, how they come across in public means everything. Plus his reaction when the people started gathering up, he's, his opening line was, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Most people, if you're going to point people to Jesus and their sins are going to be well, removed that's my point, and yeah. he can raise them from the yeah. dead, most people would say, and what was John saying? Well, he... He just said, "You brood of vipers, who, who warns you?" That's where I was rap. going with this. Can you imagine the meeting with John the Baptist's followers? And now here's what I'm going with, you know, because he's the marketing campaign for Jesus. I'm telling you, he said, "I think we should start off with you brood of vipers." Yeah, <laughs> he did everything the exact opposite of what the culture. You know, they come up with this phrase counterculture. Well, John the Baptist invented that. I'm telling you. So, you, you just wouldn't have thought. But that you could was play this game. You could play this game, and I'm telling you, churches, this would the game would be: Would you rather have a group of men in leadership at your church who looked together, who had money, who well dressed, professional, or would you rather have a group of leaders who look like John the Baptist? But we're high character, and I think that's the difference. Yeah, that, that was the message that that came out. No, and there's no doubt as the as culture evolved into what it's become, good or bad, that 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 same mindset came right along with the church. And then we had a, like the leaders of a church were like a boardroom, mm-hmm. and so you know you had your president, your vice president, your secretary, your treasurer. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it it just does it. But how many, I mean, look, I, I'm, I, I get, you know, we were talking about being offended or unoffended earlier. Maybe that was during commercials. But uh, what offends me is I've seen guys, because I, I listen to a lot of sermons, you know, online, whatever. I've seen guys preaching sermons on John the Baptist and they, their outfit is a, uh, you know, they had the skinny je- the the boots, the space boots, Elf and the boots, skinny yeah. jeans, and the sat- hat hat off to the side. You know, yeah. and I'm like, of course, you see that a lot, and I, I noticed that just going from a lot of different churches and speaking, and I'm like, what 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 is that? Yeah, what what is that? What are you? What? Are, why are we doing that? Why are we having a a way? Of what we look, I mean, it's not not a reflection on character whatsoever, but it just kind of bothers me that I'm like, well, Jesus's marketing campaign was a guy in the wilderness wearing camel skin. That's never been a thing. 
Y'all might remember that the church asked me to play John the Baptist. Remember it well. In a series of events. And I'll tell you, I came from the back, going toward the front, looking to my right and my left, saying what John the Baptist said. No, I was there. It was scary. People cried. I mean, well, I, I was I'm, horrified. It used to, I mean, because you did it with such passion and all. It made me nervous. So one of our uh, sponsors, Covenant Eyes, are some of our favorite folks because, I, Zach, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I don't know of a bigger scourge uh, and plot that the evil one has come up with than pornography uh, in oh, its man. effect on on everybody, on marriage and on everybody. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. It's, it has captivated the imaginations of many, many, many young men and women and uh, – and really in a way that's that's just devastating people and devastating relationships and marriages and lives. I mean, it is it is a, a massive evil. So over half of divorces, 56%, list pornography as the major factor that led to divorce. 90% wow. of children 8 to 16 have viewed pornography online while doing homework. So, I mean, this is the pervasive nature of it, of course, with the Internet, with phones, with computers – and things that are so uh, easily accessible now, it started a much, much younger age. And Zach and I have um, read several articles and books about the negative impact, even beyond spiritually what we know it does, the negative impact it does just culturally uh, and on people and that are addicted to it. So uh, th- these guys, what they're doing is helping all of us have some accountability because accountability is such a big deal um, in our spiritual walk, we have each other, but we also need, in this case, we need someone help holding us accountable when it comes to these devices. Uh, and that's what they do. Uh, they have software for phones, computers, other devices that foster online integrity uh, through relationships. And that's really what it's all about. And I feel like it's a, it's a striving for that relationship. And it comes back as something very fake when it comes to pornography, because it's not real. So we want you to check these guys out. Uh, it's good for good and healthy for everybody, for your children. Sign up for a free 30 days of Covenant Eyes today uh, by going to CovenantEyes.com and enter the code Phil to get started. So that's um, CovenantEyes.com. Enter the promo code Phil. You get a free 30 days. Uh, let them get it across your platforms and devices and uh, and bring some accountability into your relationships. It's uh, We love these guys. We love what they're doing. We've got to start making a difference, so we encourage you to check these guys out. So Dad had memorized this passage that we'll actually get into on probably the next podcast, and that's what you came in with. And they had you dressed in a camel hair-ish oh, yeah. outfit. You were barefooted. Yeah. And you had a big staff. Remember that, Jay? He had a big yeah. stick. Yeah. And you just, like, nobody warned anybody. The opening act was you just walking down the middle aisle yelling this text. <laughs> <laughs> you, t- you did it on Saturday night and a Sunday morning. I, I remember it well. You know, I, I just looked there. around. You know, you brood of virus, and I could see women and what doing going. <laughs> 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 you scared them, Phil. <laughs> I'm serious. But I think le- the story leading into this will, because I do think this is another thing that causes people to ponder. Because you have Jesus born, and then you only have this one story about and from. Think about it. He's He became famous for something that had never been mentioned from Genesis through Malachi, when the, when and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a four hundred year lull, and the and and somebody looks up and says, "Who in the world?" Heard somebody hollering, coming up out of the desert there over there, you know, and they all looked at who in the world is that? I mean, they thought had had no idea that Jesus was on his way and has arrived, and now we we're getting down to it. But you just think about it. He's walking out across the desert, and he's the first person in the Bible to ever mention, and he becomes famous for it, anyone being baptized in water. Right. And I've always no, thought— I agree. We should talk about that. I, I but, thought, um, you know, it, 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 everybody tries to dismiss it at some point, but I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, 
He instituted that. No one had ever heard of that before. Anybody being well, I mean, like water? the scholars will say, well, there were ceremonial washings and and of sorts. But I agree with you. It's like that was the campaign. Yeah. You got four hundred years of silence. You got a guy raised by wolves because his parents were so old. I mean, he's You're nicknamed baptizer. He became he became orphaned. And, I mean, you would assume because his parents were so old, they were past childbearing age. So you figure he's just out there in the woods. When the Nazarite vow that he was under, not only was it was it not drinking any you know anything any alcohol, but it was also never cutting his hair or beard. Yeah. So well, exactly. Imagine. So, I mean, we're talking Gandalf look, here. Way way worse than us. No, and it. He's living in the woods. And this is the campaign, and then he starts baptizing people, and they're like. Yeah. Okay, let me get this right. You're gonna, Can you imagine you're gonna people who never me. heard it? They're, they're looking at each other and said, he's going to do what? And he's going to push you, go over there, he's going to push you down in the water and bring you back up. They're like, and and they did. Yeah. And, and, and they said, he convinced them. Yeah. Well, that's why, I, even the concept- that's why I say, what is baptism? It's a very good question. Cause it is. It, it's a surrender. Only a person- who is surrendering? I mean, I put it back when I was on social media four or five years ago. I actually used that word, something about surrender and baptism. You would have thought. I've never seen so much controversy. Yeah, people's like, "Oh no, it's not a surrender," and you know, I got yeah. it's a symbol, and I got I got every religious view of baptism, which I realized then. This this is this is embarrassing, you know, for unbelievers to just listen to. Christian people talk about what baptism is. I know because I'm not sure we know collectively. <laughs> you know, it was it was like the they didn't like the the verbiage. I, I'm sure somebody can go look it up five years ago and see exactly what I said. But I remember they didn't like that part about saying it was a surrender, which I don't know why. But if you think about John, getting people to do that, that is a it, it's a humbling surrendering to this world there's no doubt about and it acknowledging the you know the heavenly and and who Jesus is someone's got earth. you by the nap of the neck and I do it all the time last week some of them are scared some of them think when they go down in the water they it scares them because somebody else has a hold of them and they're just being pushed Plus, there's a surrender, and 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 there are a lot of people I've, I've done that, especially women, and it scares the daylights out of them. I mean, it scares them, and I, I tell them, I said, "Don't worry, don't worry." I said, "I'm not going to turn you loose." It's, I mean, I've seen a lot of reactions from that. I can only, and when John the Baptist case, it's never been heard of, and somebody the likes of him walking up out of there, paving the way for the Son of God. It just uh, all the way from the the miraculous showing being born in a barn, Jesus Christ, and the one that's paving the way for him looks like he's been on. I mean, just come up out of the woods. I mean, just think about what that that individual looked like. Most people would have took off running the other way. And said, "Good night." What if you could? You think about if you what could, is that? If you could ever come up with an act. That got about as close to symbolizing you dying and being brought back to life. It yeah. would be being plunged underwater because you really can't would. live underwater. Yeah. So if you stay down there long enough, you will die physically. So the question I mean, is, Jay, I mean, it's really a brilliant why would be concept when you be think about so it. So against that, because, I mean, they, I mean, we got. Yeah, I'm gonna explain. You asked me a question. I'm gonna explain it because it gets confusing because then John's baptism is then related to what Jesus was going to do. So, because yep. he then says, well, the, you know, I baptize you in water for forgiveness of sins, but there's one coming after me, Jesus, which was the marketing campaign. He'll baptize you with the Spirit or in fire. Yeah. And so it's like, well, what exactly? So do we not use that anymore? And then so you have you have a couple of occurrences in Acts where... People were caught in the middle of this, 
and were baptized by John. You remember that? Where's that? Acts, uh, Acts 19. 19. No spirit is given. Well, John they said, we ain't 10. even heard there is a spirit. And it's like, well, what baptism did you receive? You know, and so I know we're just introducing this, but. And then you get to Ephesians 4, and it's like there's one God and Father of all. There's one Lord, faith. one faith. And it says there's one baptism. Yep. He was like, well, I thought there was two. John's and Jesus's, you know. So I think it's confusing, and and especially people who focus on grace, because you can't, there's nothing you can do individually to save yourself. Is that you were saved by grace? Every, Every, all of us agree with that. Yep. So when you interject something like baptism, people don't understand what to do with that because the human mind thinks, well, isn't that you doing something? Which, I really think it's quite the opposite. Even today, you're not doing anything. You're you're just surrendering your it's will. It's being done to it's you. Or done part to you. Oh, yeah, I mean, physically. So what I think, and we can talk about it when we get there, but I do think that Jesus, this if you put John the Baptist preparing the way in chapter 3, 1 through 20 at least, 20, yeah. I think that should be, I mean, I wish Luke would have put 321 right after the end of chapter 2 because I think those two things go go more together. So it's kind of like Mark, you know, when we read there was a story within a story. But this is the way yeah. Luke did it because he had John the Baptist being born, Jesus. He's been so flipping he's going back, back and, and forth, forth the whole time. Because yeah. here's my point. I think... What happened in the temple with Jesus at 12 years old relates to Jesus' baptism because it becomes about when God said, this is my son. Well, that becomes the theme of what happened in the temple because he said, I'm in my, you know, I had to be at my father's house. And his parents were like, son? What are you doing? You know, I mean, remember his mom. Yeah, how could you, mom, how, yeah. why did you treat us this way? So, do you like to be surprised, Jace? Do you still like? To, can you can you still be surprised at this point in your life? Do things surprise you? I'm surprised that you asked me <laughs> if I like surprises. <laughs> so yes. Well, I, you know, some people just get to the point where they don't like to be surprised. I like to be surprised. Uh, every month, I get a a box of awesome. And Zach, you do as well. Have you gotten a, a box uh, this month of, from our friends at Bespoke Post? Yeah, I just got one uh, a few days ago. And the one that I got before that was, it was perfect timing because, you know, I did the the uh, canoe trip down the Swanee River where I caught all the fish. And um, <laughs> it's... Uh, now he's caught <laughs> fish. <laughs> well, that's changed a lot since the trip. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> so, the, yeah, one of the items I got was a, um, I got a... Um, a really nice thermos uh, that I put my coffee in, um, and then I had a host of other. Pro- I got a knife that was super awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and uh, and then and then I got a headlamp, a really good headlamp for camping. So uh, their gear is, I love it. It's absolutely amazing. Like I, when I get that in the in the mail each month, I'm like, I'm, I'm I'm excited to open it. So what they do is they they tailor your box to you, of course. And uh, if you're like Zach and you like to do camping and hiking and things like that, a lot of products for that uh, could be other things that you like to do. You go and you take a quiz at boxofawesome.com. And so there, they're going to help pick out the right stuff for you. And then it's a surprise. It shows up at your house uh, every month, a lot of different categories. Each box is valued at $70, but you only pay a fraction of that price. So you're saving money. Um, box of awesome support small business, which we love. 90% of everything that comes in your box is uh, from a small up and coming brand, which we like that it's free to sign up. You can skip a month or you can cancel anytime you get 20% off your first monthly box. When you sign up at box of awesome.com, enter the code Phil at checkout. So it's box of awesome.com. Use the code Phil for 20% off your first box. Check them out. For yeah, I think that's in verse. Well, I, I can read it if we want to go to forty one. It says Luke two forty one. So every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was twelve, they went up to the feast according to the custom. Now, 
I believe, Al, I mean, maybe you or Zach have a different opinion. I think in the Jewish culture, culture, when you were 12, that was the year before you were like, it's kind of like what we do. I did it with all my kids. When they got to be 12 or 13, we kind of had a, a moment where like you're becoming an adult. I think we call it a blessing, but a charge or whatever. They, ba- they basically based it on puberty when you hit puberty as a, as a, a young boy, man. And so do we. Yeah. And so it was, well, we've done the- it's around 12 or 13 and you're right. What they would do was the tradition was, which also means this was probably Jesus' first time to go to Passover when he was 12, which would make it the marvel of it even more for him. But you, you're right. They would send them to the feast a year or two before this this coming of age part when they were around 13 or so. And, and for kids, it's different. But you know, today, even Jay's in the current modern Jewish culture, they call it a bar mitzvah, which is a recognition yeah. at about 13 that now you're entering into being able to. They call it the son of the covenant or the son of the law. In other words, now you're old enough to understand what law is, is basically what they're saying, or what the yeah. covenant is. Yeah. So we did the same thing with my kids. We like yeah, My I daughter, too, I my gave girls. them a purity ring, and my sons, mm-hmm. I gave them a charge, and we all had their you know friends and, and spiritual people around and prayed over them. Because going, being a teenager is probably the toughest lot in life. You're, you're trying to figure out your identity and your hormones are all over the place, yep. puberty and all that. So the the reason I think that the reason this is in here, it's my opinion, but is because he's gonna Jesus is gonna make the transition. He's concluded that his his father is in heaven. Now he he wasn't you know, and everybody goes through this identity thing because his mom was a virgin when he was born. And so I think you'll see that play out here because he's at the age where that really matters more than any other time because we all have been through it. You go through your identity crisis. I think that the the centrality of where this is happening is important because it's, I mean, he's going into the temple again. I mean, I I love to point out the importance of the temple and Jesus's ministry. You know, even going back to what you're mentioning about, about, um, John the Baptist, when he shows up, I mean, there's a connection there to this this idea of the temple. Even here, uh, um, it says in verse 27 of 2, moved by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, and then he gives this this prophetic message, but... But even in, in John's baptism, you know, going back to that for a little bit, but John's baptism, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. So there's, that's one baptism, which is John the Baptist's baptism of repentance, and he did it with water. But then he prophesies of the coming of Jesus. He says, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. Now, he's going to do a different kind of baptism. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So you got John's water baptism. you got Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those are two different types of baptisms. The, the, what, what separates these two baptisms more than anything is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you're connected with Christ, uh, you, God moves in you, and you actually become the temple. So there's a new establishment of a new temple that's going to happen because you become the housing place of God. And I think Luke's account is interesting to me because Jesus, even at the age of 13, is going into this main center of worship to kind of establish his credibility. Uh, it's kind of this first moment of, of him getting some street credibility because he goes in and what he says is like profound. Well, what's prophesied over him is profound. And then how, and then they're marveled at how well he understands the scripture. So it's like this credibility moment. It happens in the temple. Ironically, the very next chapter, John the Baptist is going to come and prophesy about the establishment of a new temple that'll happen through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I think is 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 pretty profound. You know, to think about that. And one thing I would add to that, Zach, is it's it's and Jace laid it out very well, I think, leading into the discussion, and we'll talk much more about it when we get there in the text, but 
it's not really an either or, but a both and, because this is happening over the course of time. In other words, John said, I baptized with water. He'll baptize with the Holy Spirit. All that's, of course, true, and that's exactly what happened. But they still baptized with water even after John was gone. Beginning yes. in the it, beginning in the first century, so well. It's, some people it's a, don't believe. Yeah, that. I know they don't, but, but I, I'm saying but that Acts eight historically is there. Other passage, you know, when the Philip and the eunuch. I mean, I, I I just don't. You'd have to rip that page out of your Bible if you didn't believe that. Right. He said they're going along in the desert, reading Isaiah. Who's the prophet talking about? You know, he right. was talking about Jesus. So Philip. I think the, Jesus, and, Jesus brought yeah, the which, Holy Spirit into the equation, which I think is what John's you, but point. But yeah. I think the to answer Phil's point earlier, though, from my and from my perspective on this, if if you make water the focal point, then I, I understand why. Well, I would push back on that. I do think water baptism is is commanded in Scripture, but the water baptism is a symbol of a spiritual baptism in Jesus. The water does not save you. I mean, Correct. that is so clear when you read what Peter well, says. Yeah, First Peter written. 3 is clear. However, I don't think, I think when you look at it as a command instead of a surrender, you're, you're, that's a tricky slope to, to go on. You know, because then you're doing it because you have to and not because you want to. And I think that matters. But I think, I mean, I just see it as being consistent because John's baptism in water didn't save either. Repentance to God is what forgives sin. And so it's the same idea of faith, whether it was John's baptism or later when the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit did, did was he changed the entire equation because to your point, Zach, which I agree with, now God lives in you. And that wasn't happening. The temple was still around when John the Baptist was running around. Nothing changed. Yeah. Well, so. that's true. But I think where it gets confusing when the spirit was on John the Baptist, the spirit was on uh, who else have we just read here in the past couple of chapters? Well, also Simeon. Uh, the Holy Spirit was on. The Holy Spirit was on. That's what gets confusing because, and even in John 7, you know, when it says, uh, Jesus said streams of living water will flow within you. And it says by this, he meant the spirit, which had not been poured out that those would later receive. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the reason this is so confusing to get back to Phil's question on well, how come people can't see it is because you seem to have the spirit on <clears throat> and working in people prior to the spirit being poured out. And it versus, goes way further than that. Well, Maybe. you got a donkey but, talking, but, well, but, but there's a difference. No, there's but. a difference. It, it, I'm just saying it. it no, seemed, there is a difference. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit being on you, and then yeah. the dwelling and the Holy Spirit and dwelling the believer. That's a different. That's I know, a different capacity. You, you know, I agree with. It. I've used this illustration hundreds of times because we when we have this discussion. You know, if you had if you drank some milk, it's in you, right? If someone threw some milk on you, well, that's a totally different circumstance. But it's still the same milk, and it's it's on and in you, right? <clears throat> but what I'm saying, Zach, is to be fair, we know that there's a difference. But if you read the Scripture just in the first two chapters, the Holy Spirit is coming. We're talking about a spirit. This is not milk. It's the Holy Spirit yeah. of God. And it's working in people. I mean, right. you, it can't be any more clear than that. I'm just saying that it's confusing to try to relate that to someone who's not in Jesus. If they're reading their Bible, they're like, well, it looks like to me the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. what, is being poured out. Well, it was working through there. And I'm saying that's a valid, you know, we need to do a better job of trying to explain this. <laughs> So uh, we're happy about one of our new sponsors, uh, Jace Medical, which I have to admit, when uh, Zach and we first met with these guys, I was like, okay, now, my brother doesn't have anything to do with this, does he? Because, you know, he has a lot of <laughs> deals going on, but <laughs> I didn't know he was in the medical business, but they were like, no, 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 this has nothing to do with your brother. It's just a strange, random coincidence <laughs> of is. life, Al. It is. And I, and <laughs> I had talked to Sean, who's the uh, the doctor, uh, who started this company, and he, he really started it back in the pandemic 
uh, because all of a sudden we had supply chain issues and other things going on, and we couldn't get our hands on antibiotics. I don't know if, Dad, if you know this, but they don't make antibiotics, hardly any in the United States anymore. Most of them are made in China, uh, which is not a good thing, uh, especially if you have issues with China, which we do, uh, and supply chain issues. So they came up with something they called the Jace case. And uh, like I said, this is nothing to do with our brother Jace, but this is a good idea, Jace, for you to think about. So it's five life-saving antibiotics that are there for emergency use. Because what happens is if you're someplace, maybe you're traveling out of the country, maybe you're just in a rural place, maybe you're hiking or camping, or maybe it's a supply chain issue, and you have something happen to you, you can't get to a doctor in the moment and get an antibiotic. And so this gives you five of those that you can have with you. All you do is go to their uh, on, to their website. You're going to sign a, an online form. In some cases, you may have to jump on a call with one of their doctors, but in most cases, no. And they handle everything else, the evaluation, the medication delivery, any ongoing consultation that you need. Uh, like I said, Sean's just a small-town doctor who saw a need uh, during the pandemic, and this is a great idea. So prepare for everything with the Jace case, and you do that by going to jacemedical.com, enter the code UNASHAME at checkout for a discount on your order. So use the promo code UNASHAME at jasemedical.com. The only thing you can do is try to teach it in context because even the baptism of the Holy Spirit that, that we see happens obviously in Acts 2 when it's poured out on the apostles who then share with the new with the people. But then even then it was in two stages because then we get to Acts 10 because the Gentiles haven't been fully. Well, maybe yet. even three because of Acts 19, the one right. I mentioned, the Spirit fell on them and they started yeah. believing in, I mean, uh, speaking in tongues. Yeah, that's what I'm saying in Acts 10. I mean, usually what, when you read the Spirit is on people, it's a miraculous type thing. But not always, because we just read two places here. You know, the Holy Spirit was on John the Baptist from birth, and you had uh, Simeon, the Holy Spirit was on it. And there, I don't think there was anything miraculous that happened, but usually well, there was it a, is. There was a, there was a, a uh, Simeon's prophecy to uh, uh, about Yeah, Jesus. I guess so. But a prophecy, was that really, uh, did he really say anything that was... He said some very... Uh, a lot of he said him he, saying he the light of for revelation of the Gentiles was a huge thing. Yeah, because at the, up until this point, except for a few uh, references, that would have been something he could not have had. Knowledge and, and, and then he also said uh, is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts and the hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So there was some pretty. I mean, there's some. There I mean, was, but I'm of, saying, I you can you can deem that from reading scriptures. What I was, and remember, John the Baptist himself w received the Holy Spirit in the womb. It came upon him. So right. I mean, here's a guy that's ahead of his time. Because, but that was my point. Out. So so to the person who we we all believe this and we all know the arguments, but I'm saying to a person who had never heard this. Oh, I understand. They're like, Well, I thought it hadn't been poured out yet. How how's it how's it on him in the womb? Right. That that's my question. Right. I'm I'm not arguing, I'm just saying that's what people when they read this, that's why this is kind of a record scratch moment. Because they're like, What you know, what why the John the Baptist? What what what? Why baptism? It had never been mentioned. Feels right. Yeah. It. He does something totally counter. I tell you something else that had never been mentioned: forgiveness of sins. I mean, forgiveness. You of read sin? the whole Old Testament. You don't see that. You no. see sacrifice. You see blood. You see Passover. But you don't read the words forgiveness of sin in the no. Old Testament. No. So that's another new phrase that John the Baptist comes up with. You know, repentance mind, though, at, the, at the beginning, though, at the very beginning of the of the Genesis account, you do see the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was no was doubt hovering over the water. So, God's Spirit. I, I, I think we. I think this is important to talk about because we want to reduce the Holy Spirit to a to an experience. We want to reduce the Holy Spirit to um, uh, maybe the the prophetic word or the miracles or all and like 
And I'm like, well, no, that's a function of stuff he's done. But we are talking about the third member of the triune God that we're, right. we're ta- who was always present and always active. It, it's not like the Holy Spirit wasn't around in the Old Testament and all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden he gets poured out and he gets invented and God creates the Holy Spirit and now he's doing stuff. No, no, no. He was there from the very beginning. And you see it in the Word. He's there from the very beginning beginning now he is going to take on an an, uh, an incredible role in the new testament because well, you see this triune god all coming together we'll get i mean not to jump forward here but we're going to see john's jesus baptism like all this is kind of coalescing into this moment where the father son and spirit are are they're actively uh instituting the kingdom here on earth the upside down kingdom and they're doing it in, in individual people's bodies if you read it if you read it you'll read about 80 to 90 times, beginning in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Book of Acts, the Corinthian letters, people were coming and, and wanting Paul only to baptize him. They still got a little confused on who's doing the baptize. But you look throughout the rest of the Bible, you start in Matthew, it's mentioned a lot. Too much to just sort of look at it and move on. I mean, there's something going on there when it comes to baptism. It's uh, it's mentioned too many times throughout the New yeah, it's, Testament. It's, no, it's been dismissed, I think. But In the beginning of it, it's, it was John the Baptist, which is amazing, you know? I think the reason why people have dismissed it, though, is, is an overreaction to those who would overemphasize it uh, and I'm not saying it's not sacramental in some ways. I, I mean, maybe there's an argument that there's a means of grace in baptism. It's hard to make a not, work out of it. You know what I'm saying, though? It's hard to make yeah, but it pe- a but, work. But people have. I mean, like, yep. I mean, I, I grew up thinking, I mean, let's be honest, I grew up being taught you have to be baptized to go to heaven, and it's what saves you, and it's when you're saved. And when we would preach the gospel— what that meant in my world was you're preaching baptism. So you actually, you're, you actually, we, we, we taught that the gospel was actually the response to the gospel. We called it the gospel. So I grew up hearing that. And I, and I, and I remember hearing the debates between the Baptists and the church of Christ people. And I'd listened to all that and, and participated in some of that. But I think that it was an overreaction to that saying, no, no, wait, wait, water doesn't save you. And, and that's true. And I think that's, so I think we're seeing now. Unless that, you're baptized of water and the spirit. It's mentioned together, and that right there, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Well, it means something. Well, he says, well, then you get into spirit. the John. Th- I mean, you're you're going to get into these arguments. No, you're right, Zach, and I. But I think that's why it's important to do what we're doing and have been doing on this podcast is study the entire New Testament in its context in relationship to show how, exactly how this was laid out. Because Zach's right. You, you don't want to ever view anything from a point of what you've always heard or maybe you were taught the wrong way. Oh, exactly. You, you have to right. approach uh, the Bible. The, 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 the eunuch who had never, he didn't even know who Jesus was. And when, when the prophet got done with him, I mean, the first pothole they passed, they stopped. And he said, look, there's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Well, well, he actually said, "Stop the chariot." Yeah, stop the chariot. I like that. Well, he, he he up until that point, he had never heard of Jesus. He said, "Who's the prophet? Who's Jesus? Who's he talking about?" Isaiah. I mean, who's he talking about? Himself or somebody else? So, yeah. Well, and look, it's it's evident that baptism was now going to be a part of the lexicon of everybody that was a believer, because not only did you see John bring it up, but the first time Peter preaches the gospel after the Holy Spirit fell on him, what does he say? What do we do? Repent, well, he does, yes. but what, I'm just trying to get to the point that Jesus himself is fixed to be baptized. And so the reason I don't want you to be distracted, because it seems like when we read the end of Luke 2, and we'll skip the John the Baptist part and go to when Jesus was bab- baptized, there's a theme in those two paragraphs, and it is the sonship of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think you'll see that. So I left off in verse 43, it says, of chapter 2. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Which, by the way, that makes it sound like he'd stay behind on purpose. He did. That's why I brought up the deal about him being 12, and he was fixed to be, you know, his, his, his 
dad, Joseph, you know, is probably mentoring him and, and getting him ready for sure. this age of accountability or whatever you want to call it in their culture. But we do the same thing. So, well, and Jesus, thinking of his idea, I mean, you got to remember, he, God became a human. He's growing, he's a, it's hard for us to look at Jesus as a six-year-old and a eight-year-old and, but he was. And so he's figured out that he's the son of God. So his parents, he's like, say, yeah. I mean, this is not like when I was a kid. I ran away multiple times. No one noticed. <laughs> a lot like here. Because, I mean, when people read this, they're like, well, he was gone three days. You know, how can you not be aware of it? Story of my childhood. <laughs> nobody you kept know. running away and nobody yeah, noticed. I'd run away and no one would notice. And actually, Jace, it's interesting because he, it was what they did was you go back and study a little bit of how they traveled when they would go in groups. The women would leave out ahead and because they travel a little bit slower. And so and then they would meet up. The men would come later. They would all connect when they were going to camp out when they had these distances to travel. And it was so their whole family. It was a, it was a, cla- right, it was a classic thing of Mary thought he was with Joseph. Joseph thought he was with Mary. But Jesus played off both of them and just stayed. So that's what happened. Which shows you how smart he was. But kids, you know, a lot of times are smarter. And he was going to be alone five days in Jerusalem yeah. at 12. So 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. That's two days, a day out, a day back. And then it took them three days once they got there. Yeah. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Because that makes more sense now. He's, He's... understanding who he is, where he came from, where he's going. I mean, as most teenagers do, his identity. But unlike a lot of teenagers, he's doing it. He's pursuing God first, which is what we all should be doing. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. I mean, he was 12 years old. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son... Why have you treated us like this? And this is so, uh, I've heard my wife say this to our kids many times, your father, and uh, <laughs> it's like it gives it more weight. You know? It doesn't say me and dad. It says your, your father. father, and, uh, and uh, It's have, like being called your whole name, you know. Oh, it's funny. I've been anxious searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Jesus asked, didn't you know I had to be, now this is the bombshell statement, in my father's house. Whoa. So he's mm. saying, yes, I'm at, I, it's like he's saying, I get what you're trying to do. Yep. I'm 12. You've been training me this year, you know, because that's what they would do in that culture. That that was the, you know, kind of the year before you, you're declared as a, as a, you know, as a man go, going through puberty and starting to do manly things. But he uses that to encounter his father, God, who, yeah. who he's right. He is the son of God. He is his father. You know, th- don't the you Holy think Spirit. that was also a little subtle statement to Joseph, even though we know later he says he goes and obeys him. So it's not being disrespectful to Joseph. Oh, no. It, to me, that's the powerful part. But he's, but he's letting Joseph know. By the way, Luke. I, I do have a father, but he's in heaven. Well, if right. you look at it carefully, that's the first thing he said there, what Jay just said. Why were, you, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? That's red letters. Well, up until that time, no red letters. So it was a, yeah. it was an unveiling moment. That's yeah, true. And, and, That's a and good think point. about th- and again to emphasize the emphasis of the of the temple here. Remember what Jesus said in John two. Whenever he the first time he overturned the temple, in John's account, it happens at the beginning of his ministry, um, which would be, I guess, if he was thirteen here, it would have been uh, twenty years later. He goes in and sees they made a mockery of it, and and he says that you've turned my father's house into a den of, of robbers, I believe is, is what it says. And then in Mark's account, right after the triumphal entry, he goes into the temple again. This is all, this is like within the last week of his life. 
and he sees the same thing happening. Um, he overturns the, the tables of the money changers and all that stuff. And he says, is it not written? These are red letters too, Phil. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. So think of the progression here. You've got 13 year old Jesus saying, did you not know I'd be in my father's house? You got Jesus at the beginning of his ministry saying, you've turned my father's house into a den of robbers. And then he goes in and he quotes this Old Testament thing. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began looking for a way to kill him. Yeah, I think there's something significant about Jesus's ministry and what's happening in this temple and then what he is going to accomplish to the cross of establishing a new temple, primarily himself as the chief cornerstone, and then all of the believers, which would be us, as other stones built upon him, the cornerstone, as together we are now a temple being built up to where God dwells. Man, there's something yeah. big, big, big happening here. No, well said. Uh, another verse that goes along with what you said is Hebrews 3, 6, which we can discuss in overtime, but it says, but Christ is faithful as a son, that's what we're talking about, over God's house, and we are his house. If we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we're out of time, uh, but we want to continue discussing this uh, in our overtime. And I like it because it's kind of we've kind of put it all together around Chapter 3, uh, which contextually is probably good because it all plays in together. So if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed to hear our overtime segment. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.